We've had a good argument here uh, about the euro bonds a second ago. And just a very basic and simple illustration here, Spain borrows at 7%, Germany borrows at 1%. Uh, we've heard many people say this is completely immoral within one union. We should have a convergence of the interest rate. Well, I think the difference is partly, and if David will excuse me, I use a, uh, a very unscientific word here, but there is a number, uh, an element of market hysteria into this, but there's also an element of economic fundamentals. And I think Draghi has basically taken out the, the the market nervousness, uh, let's put it that way, and have reduced the interest rates as we have seen, but I don't think the rest of it should disappear and we should go for a complete alignment. Why? Because there are economic fundamentals and because if we did that and a Spanish election was coming up, what would prevent the uh, Prime Minister of saying, what the hell, we start a big uh, uh, spending program now in Spain here to get re-elected and, and after all, all the others would pay for it because he's solid there about this debt. So I think it is a dangerous thing, and therefore I have a very clear answer to the question of uh, euro bonds. But I do admit that we have an enormously uh, big problem here. Let me say, by the way, there is one thing <coughs> because it was said that interest rates were relatively high in the eurozone, but after all, they are much, much lower than they would be if we didn't have the euro, because what we then would have had is a series of devaluations. Basically, everybody devaluating against Germany. That was what always happened, and interest rates shooting up. Let me remind you that before, uh, in the years before Italy joined the euro, they spent 11% of their total GDP to service the debt, which, by the way, then was 120% of GDP, which it is today. I think it's constitutionally, so it has to be 120%. It's always up there. But they spent 11% of their GDP. Today, they spent half. So the lower interest rates and stability has given everybody an advantage, plus has given an enormous gift to Germany. I've been trying to write that in the Handelsblatt and elsewhere, but not really started a debate about it. You don't need to always yell and scream in Germany because you have great benefits out of the fact that you have currency stability, and that is reflected also in the trade situation. But this is a big issue. I think we have pulled the austerity out of the way down for quite a while. I think we need to change the focus to the other side, basically, and we need to do that because of this. I can understand why in Berlin you're saying, hey, what's wrong with the economy? It's going quite well. But you can probably also understand why this is a huge, huge issue in Spain. That unemployment, <coughs> the fact that 45% of all young people like you doesn't have a prospect to get a job. So you get to a very long education, or maybe a shorter education, when you go out there, the best job you can get is during the summer, you might have a a three-month job as a receptionist at a, at, a, at a holiday hotel or something like that. So what is happening there is a, a number of things. Uh, first of all, we'll see uh, all these demonstrations all over the place, including over here in the UK, because people are beginning to cut in, this, in, in the welfare society we have in Europe, and people obviously get angry, because if you're unemployed, it doesn't have a chance to get a job. And at the same time, your unemployment benefits and other benefits are being cut down. Of course, people get it. And uh, we see a number of more serious things happening around in Europe. The first thing is, for example, in Greece. The outright Nazi party in Greece is beginning to wear uniform. They begin to play a big role in society. They're beginning to hand notes out to people, say, if you have trouble, don't call the police. Call us. You can't trust the police, but you can trust us. We know that the fastest growing party, political party in Italy, is led by a comedian who has absolutely no politics, but is very, very popular. <laughs> we know in the, the Netherlands that the uh, extreme right wing is gaining force and definitely being anti European as well. Uh, we see the same in Belgium, but there the problem is a bit different because they only hate each other, they naturally hate each other. Well, so that's a smaller problem. But we're seeing in Austria that the Heider Party apparently is stronger than ever. Uh, we see a number of these things, and I'm worried about Spain as well because that high youth unemployment, as they can't all emigrate to Argentina and Brazil, some of them are beginning to talk about arming themselves and begin to, you know get some political influence that way. And I'm also hearing some people from the older generation beginning to say, hey, wait a minute, 
in the Franco days, there was no unemployment, was there? Right? Everything was so nice. Do you understand what I'm heading? And I'm very much agreeing with you, Sean. My worry is that if we now embark into a process as outlined, theoretically fine, but outlined in the blueprint for Barroso, that we will spend the political energy on focusing over the next five years to get a treaty that will be rejected by people everywhere. <coughs> The issue of the German constitution is very important as well. I would simply not like to see the debate about that constitutional change in, in Germany. I would not like to see the front page of the Bill Seidel uh, show lazy Greeks, you know, and should we really be solidary with that? So I think we should go the pragmatic way. And the pragmatic way is to do some of the things that are obvious to do, like the banking union and other uh, relatively uh, small things, and then actually really begin to focus on the growth and jobs. And everybody tells me, including the big guys that I talked to, this is not possible. We don't have any, uh, any instruments to do so. But there's a lot of psychology into this. And do not tell me that if we could spend time and be conceiving all those solutions that I showed you before, if we really <coughs> put the brains together, that we could not do something that would move Europe forward. But it does include flexibility from member states as well. Because a big deal of that is, for example, uh, evening the European single market. I would like to take it in a green direction, in a more digital direction. But I also want a more flexible European labor market chat. I have to say that. Uh, because otherwise, uh, we cannot actually handle the threats of the demographics, as you rightly said, and our competition with South Korea, uh, China, India, and all the other centers in the world. So I think we need to sacrifice something there again. And the minute you make cel very celebratory speeches about we need to do something about the single market, and as soon as it then affects yourself, begin to talk about the Polish blah, blah, then there's something wrong. And the same goes for our envy of the growth centers around in the world. Why do we not trade more with it? Why do we not go into deep and comprehensive free trade agreements like we did with South Korea last year? Well, because there's an emerging protectionism in Europe. And some people think if their car factories can't sell cars, it's because of competition from the outside. It cannot be because our cars are not good enough, right? So there is something to deal with there as well. I also want to tell you, you might say it's peanuts, but there's 80 billion of frozen structural funds in Brussels, mostly going to countries in the deepest need. There's a lot of bureaucratic explanations why the money is not being spent, but that could be part of the growth plan. And then, as my time is very short, let me just say the issue about the Euro Project bonds that has been very, very misunderstood. And the problem is we call them Euro Project bonds, and uh, this is and uh, and therefore uh, a lot of people, even in Germany, <coughs> thought that this was the same as Euro bonds. It is true. There has been a misunderstanding. This is not the case. The Euro Project wants us about something completely different. It is about something that could actually lead to a kind of a new deal in Europe by investing in infrastructure projects, primarily in transport, in the digital area, and in energy. Uh, and, and the whole idea is that you identify a number of uh, bankable projects, I mean, projects that can generate an income. Last night I flew into Stansted Airport, uh, and uh, it took us two hours to go here. So I would recommend a good project being uh, a, a motorway directly from Stansted to Warwick. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking a bit here, but this could be a big in infrastructure project, for example, in the energy area. And <coughs> then that the EU budget goes in. Well, I can actually illustrate it for you here because I made a little, a little uh, chart of it. That, that a little bit of the debt is actually covered with a guarantee from the European Union and the European Investment Bank, which is highly respected at the markets and so on. Now, we've just launched the first pilot project of this. It's good news, but the bad news is there's absolutely no money in it. The little money that comes from the EU budget comes from the EU budget. And as you know, this may be not what you hear, but it is very small. And we spend a lot of it on other things. So the little envelope used to guarantee for this New Deal project is very small. It doesn't need to be very big, but it's very limited. Um, one euro invested here will have a leverage of about 20. 
And you know, one of the things that's being discussed about the budget right now is to exactly take that element out of the budget. So there's a populist discussion, certainly in this country, about we save here, they need to save in Brussels. These people over there are too, uh, paid too highly, we need to strip them you know, of their uh, salaries and pensions and so on. Yeah, fine, that's a good populist debate. But there are useful things in the budget. For example, the guarantees for the budget bonds. And I think, David, there's a lot of uh, uh, long-term, not very risk-willing uh, capital out there who would like to go into AAA-rated investments like these, guaranteed by the European Investment Bank, at least for a part, part of it. Uh, let's say over 30 years, over 40 years, over 50 years, pension funds, etc., etc. It is a brilliant idea, but it's not moving anywhere. And my big blame here is that why are we not making it into a real Roosevelt New Deal kind of things by stripping the relationship to the EU budget and just let the EU governments quite simply set up a fund to guarantee for these budgets? But because they will all be good projects, and no taxpayers will ever lose any money out of it. 